Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today um, was actually the topic of the, the podcast last week. And Holly and I tapped on it a little bit in our conversation. And I will have her back now that we've got some of our tech stuff figured out. Uh, we don't know what, well, we did figure out what happened. So we were able to fix it after the show, but we'll have Holly back as well. Um, but really want to talk this week about um, that whole idea of presence versus power. And um, I think I mentioned briefly, I had listened to an interview on how I built this um, with Rashad Robinson, who is the CEO, uh, president and CEO of Color of Change. And he talked about presence versus power. And actually the podcast last week was, was delving a little bit deeper into that, that um, just because you have presence doesn't mean you have power. So, and, and what struck me about that being so powerful is that um, in this, in this day and age of, of social media and how many followers do we have? And I've seen a lot of postings um, lately about, about followers and how do we, how do you get more followers? Someone's always out there trying to tell you how to get more followers, right? And being an influencer and all these kind of things. And, and in and of itself, that's not bad, right? You you want to get your message out. You want people to be able to, to hear you. Pardon me. Got the hiccups. Want people to be able to hear you because in order to serve, people need to be able to find you. So that that's clear. The challenge is when it's presence for presence sake, right? Just that, that name recognition. Everybody knows. It's like cheers, right? Everybody knows your name. Well, that's wonderful, except what Rashad talks about is presence is just presence, right? Everybody may know you, but power is when you can actually make change, when you can actually facilitate making a difference, when you can make an impact, that's power. And presence does not necessarily equal power. So everybody may know who you are, but just because they know who you are doesn't mean they're going to do what you want them to do or follow where you want them to go. It just means, oh, they're kind of cool, right? So having power actually gives you the ability to impact change, to make change, to make decisions. That's what power means. And then as I was thinking about it today, <clears throat> with so much stuff that's been going on and, and craziness and, and just messiness, really, really messy brain this week. Um, and, and how that, some of that power and presence is just being present. Right. And, and so when we talk about about presence, he was talking about it in the context of when you have power, do you have presence? Right. That people know who you are. The other kind of definition of presence is when you show up, do you have presence? We say, does somebody command a room? Do they you know, are, are you kind of drawn to them? Is there something about them that just exudes confidence? Right. And and the example I give is this dear friend of mine. She's she's just amazing. She's amazing. And um, just retired as a general counsel. And she's just, I, I just can't say enough about her. And, but I don't have permission to use her name, so I'm not going to use it yet. And she's an attorney, so, you know. Um, but she's fantastic. And one of the things that I loved about her, and, and you see this every once in a while, but one of the things I loved about her was she was not a person who talked a lot, right? So a lot of times you think about people who have presence and these big personalities, they're always talking. They always have something to say. Well, she was someone who, who didn't, she very rarely had a lot to say. And you would see her in these situations with very senior people, boards of directors, um, senior executives, because again, she's, you know, sitting in general counsel. Um, and she really wouldn't be saying much. And what happens in that situation is people make assumptions when you're quiet, because there's an old saying, right? Better to be silent and be thought of fool than open your mouth and prove the point, right? So she'd be really quiet and people would assume she wasn't paying attention or nothing was going on or what have you, right? She just wasn't engaged. And sometimes that happens when you're quiet. I mean, you do need to find times to use your voice. But the thing about her was that because she didn't use her presence to command attention, when she did speak, it was like pins dropped. People were hanging on every single word. Why? Because when she had something to say, it was profound. It was on point. It was like the elephant in the room. It was the thing that nobody else was thinking about. It was um, speaking truth to power. And so she used her presence, right, which was mostly about kind of just this quiet confidence, this quiet power, 
she used her presence to promote the power of her voice because she used her voice selectively, right? So that's one example I like to use. The other thing I like to talk about when, we, when we're looking at power versus presence is the presence that's attached to humility and vulnerability and authenticity, right? All those words we've been using, but also transparency. And Holly talked about this a little bit yesterday, how she said, you know, there was a story she told to us that she hadn't told anywhere else. And I remember when she interviewed me on her podcast, there was something I told her I had never told anybody else, not publicly. I mean, people knew clearly, but I'd never said it publicly. And what that made me begin to think about in this whole idea of, of presence and power and as you're thinking of, of your leadership, right? Because it's behavior, not position. Is your leadership and your career and your career flow is part of the power you command is your confidence and competence around being vulnerable and telling your story around your imperfection, right? Those places where you have fallen down, those places where you have had major public failures, or those places where you simply don't know the answer. In the group that I'm in, I, um, I'm on the board of a, an organization that's the senior leaders of HR here in Houston. And we meet uh, regularly four times a year, <clears throat> eight times a year. Um, and we always, it's, it's the reason we put the group together is because there are very few safe spaces for the most senior HR people. Because there are things that we, we experience, there are things that we know, there are things that we are charged to do that you just can't tell everybody. It's kind of like the HR person and the general counsel. There's stuff that we know that can not only hurt people, but can damage organizations, right? So you, you just don't always have a safe space as HR people. And so the ability, it, we were we were getting together and we just happened to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and belonging at this particular one. And, and started having the conversation in this topic around, you know, how we get leaders comfortable with this and how we start talking about it and what does it really mean? and how do we measure without that whole drama about, you know, quotas and, and just all the madness, right? Because we as executives have to push that conversation. We have to push it forward, but you also have to be cognizant of meeting people where they are. And one of the things that came up from the guest speaker and, and also my friend, um, Dina Clark, who's incredible in this space, has always said is, you know, the most senior level executives also need to have a place to be vulnerable. They need to have a place where they can say, you know what? This is a bias that I have and I, 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 I just do and I need to work through it and I need to make sure it doesn't manifest in behaviors that are detrimental to me or to others. Or my lived experience is different and I understand my privilege. Notice I didn't say white privilege. I said my privilege because quite frankly, if you woke up today, you are in some privilege, okay? Because there are many people who did not or there are many people who are waking up on a ventilator, right? Or many people who are waking up on the street or homeless. So we all have some level of privilege when we are doing some kind of comparison. But, you know, how can I sit and say, you know, I, I recognize my privilege and my lived experience is different. How do I sit in that and own that and, and allow myself to be vulnerable enough to listen to other people's experiences and not negate them? Because I just because I didn't live them doesn't mean they're not real, right? That's about microaggression when you're negating someone else's lived experience because it's not yours. That's a form of microaggression, not not seeing people, right? And so how do you create these spaces where as leaders, you can be vulnerable? Because again, the further you get up in the organization, the more you get the pressure to have all the answers, the more you get to pr the pressure to always be on your game, to always be you know, confident and, and happy and engaged and all these kind of things, right? Because you're towing the company line. The problem with that is we're all human. So the position may say you got to be on your game all the time, but our humanity says that's just not possible. It's not realistic. So how do we create spaces so that our presence, right, can be authentic and realistic? And if you think about the leaders that we follow, the leaders that really have the greatest impact, it's the leaders who have come out to people and said, you know what, I jacked that up. And, but here's what we're going to do about it. Or the leaders who have said, you know what, this is a space in which I am really uncomfortable and I don't know, but we are going to figure this out together, right? The leaders who 
figure out that imperfection is a bond, right? That is a connector of people. Because yes, it's lovely to look at all the beautiful and shiny. We love the glossy pictures and we love the lashes and the, you know, and the heels and the suits and that we love the pretty. But the messy is what helps us relate. The messy is what helps us connect to somebody to know that we're not just problematic. We're not just, our life is not just horrible, that we have a kindred spirit in the mess. It's the mess that makes us human. It's the mess that makes us real. It was, it was so real when I posted on Monday that said, I woke up Monday morning, my brain was messy and I could easily get to that place where I'm like, okay, Laurel, stop, stop, stop. Just focus on the one thing. Cause I can literally carry on four or five conversations in my head at the same time and be really present. I mean, I really thought until I had lots of therapy, I really thought I was nuts, but it's just, it, it is just a superpower that I have, right? I am able to focus on multiple things at the same time. Um, or have multiple conversations at the same time. And so instead of moving myself into that habit of one thing, one thing, get focused, it's okay, get rid of the mess, calm down, get quiet, get still, which is all important because sometimes when it's really messy, I have to get still or I can't function. But I had to sit and own and say, no, 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 but the mess is what makes me me. My ability to hold on to what people say at a deep level while they're continuing to talk enables me to hear, interpret, connect, and regurgitate to them in ways that give them an opportunity to see dots that they didn't connect. In some cases, dots they didn't even see that were there. That is my God-given superpower. And it took me a long time to get there to say, okay, that's not weird. That's just, that's my superpower. That's why I'm able to do what I do. You know, I had somebody tell me the other day, it's like career therapy when we talk to you, right? <laughs> And I'm not claiming to be a therapist, y'all. So don't, you know, nobody sue me because I'm not, I'm not claiming. In fact, my contract says I am not a therapist and I will refer you if it looks like that's what you need. But that mess isn't always just something to be fixed or something to run away from. There's power in being present with the mess. That doesn't mean you wear the mess as a cape, right? As I've said many, many times, people don't always need to know how the sausage is being made. They just need to know they're having sausage. So you don't have to wear the, the madness, you know, as a badge, unless it says vote. But it is something that you can use in your toolbox to connect to people to say, you are not alone in how messy things are right now. Because the world is messy. Society is messy. It's just madness. And when you are able to take a mess address the mess for what it is honestly and authentically including saying i don't know but we're gonna figure it out and fix it there is power in that here's a perfect example what's going on with southwest right now now i i do fly southwest southwest is not always my carrier of choice because that's a nerve issue right that whole madness of, of the cattle call just make, makes me a little crazy and people who don't fly very often and they can't even, you know, no, baby, your boarding pass says C and they're calling A. Can you just sit down a minute? I can't, I can't with all that, right? It's just, it's just, it's sensory overload for me. But the thing about Southwest always, they have never lost a bag for me. Never. Their, their agents are always pleasant. I mean, I've just always had great experiences other than that, than the people experiences. The actual Southwest agents and Southwest, the company and the flying experiences has never been an issue for me. Um, it's always been pleasant and they can be so funny, right? But this debacle that they just had and how they responded to it is a perfect example of an immediate hit to a brand. Immediate. Because you're going to claim weather and FAA <laughs> and nobody else is impacted. And what's so bad about that is that it shows how fleeting, right? It takes years to build trust and it can be gone in a second. Let's say trust comes in on a Greyhound, but it leaves on a Maserati. In a nanosecond, this organization, this huge organization that apparently has really needed to reevaluate the way it schedules flights for, for a long time, 
had a perfect storm of stuff happen, whatever the stuff is, because I still, as of this morning, I still haven't heard the details of what the stuff actually was. I don't know that anybody has yet. Um, if you have, put it in the chat for me, in the comments, and, and I'll call it out. In a nanosecond, this perfect storm happened, and it uncovered the weaknesses in their system and the weaknesses in their process, which we all have those. Every business has them. We all personally have them. But your response to that is what either has people trusting you and staying with you or running from you. Mm -hmm. In this case, it either has people saying, okay, I get it. You know, it's travel. Even if you don't travel a lot, you know, it's travel, things happen or swarming the, the, the customer service desk ticked off and being nasty because of the way you responded. And guess what? The employees are in the middle of that, right? The corporate organization made an announcement and the folks, the boots on the ground get to deal with that and the impact. And so when you talk about power and presence, how are you showing up in those most difficult situations with authenticity, with care and concern for your people, with honesty, with alignment? How are your actions aligning with who you said you are? Because in those moments, that's where great leaders are made mm -hmm. or broken or broken. And what we're seeing is a prime example of an organization that has taken a huge brand hit, huge brand hit from one single incident that likely could have been managed much differently, much differently. Now, who knows what the issue is? And again, depending on what it happens, you can't necessarily just open, you know, the Komodo and say, here's everything that went wrong today. But you at least need to give people enough information that they know that you're being honest and forthright. And more importantly, that you know what went on. And if you don't, you can say, we have no idea what happened, but here's what we're doing to fix it. Right. And we, because this happened here, we're going to have to cancel these flights here. Here's what it means for you. And here's what we're going to do about it. Right. It's early and constant notification, early and constant communication. It's that vacuum where things start to get ugly in the absence of information. People will make it up. People will decide what the real issue is. People will decide how they're going to respond based on what you've given them to work with. And if you've given them nothing, you can't be mad when they respond in interesting ways. You can be disappointed and you don't necessarily have to take the abuse, but, but you can't be surprised. You can't be mad because see, that was a situation that was triggered by a different action. So when you think about this presence and this power, you can be present all day long. You can show up to everything. You can be in every place. You can be in every magazine. You can be on every TV show. You can be on every radio show. You can do 4 million podcasts. You can be on every app. You can be everywhere, everywhere. Everybody can know your name. They can know your face. But the real power is when you open your mouth, what do people say? And more importantly, do you have to, or does your reputation for your actions support who you really are and the power behind your presence? How are you really showing up when you do? Are you just showing up and making the rounds and being, you know, hey, here I am, look at me. Or are you showing up, making an impact, changing lives, serving people, got something to say that's profound, that makes people think, or that makes people feel better or feel differently about something? What are you doing with that presence? Because if it's presence just to be presence, okay, well, I guess there's some stuff in that, but there's probably more things you could be doing with your time that better serve you and serve others. Just a thought. I'm just saying, just a thought. But we got to think about that, that power of our presence as more active than just the name recognition. More active than just a picture or a photo or a, a perceived reputation, right? That, that power is built over time. That power is built by 
people being able to rely on, well, every time I see them, this is how they, this is how they show up every single time. I can count on this being who they are. I can count on them being in this place at this time with this attitude. And I can count on if I'm seeing behavior that seems contrary, they're probably going to explain what's going on. You begin to build trust and begin to have power when people can count on you to be consistent. Consistent in how you show up, consistent in how you respond to things, consistent in how you behave. And I'm not saying it's easy because we all have those moments. We all have messy moments. We all have messy ideas. We all have messy brains at some point in time. It's just how do we manage through that, right? And how do we understand what that mess is? And if that mess is really related to some kind of limiting belief that we're projecting or that's being projected onto us, right? Because sometimes that mess is about what we can't do, right? An, ex an experience that is telling us a story and the story may or may not be true. The story may or may not be true. So when you are really talking about showing up authentically and you're telling people about what's going on in your brain and why, why you're feeling the way you are, why you're acting the way you are, when you start talking about those experiences, and this is, this is coming after a lot of work, y'all. So I'm not, I'm not a genius. This is just what I have learned through my own deep work is sometimes that messiness is connected to an experience that happened a long, long time ago. And the experience is real. The experience is a fact. But the story associated with the experience may or may not be. So you may have experienced when I show up in these places, dressed like this, nobody pays attention to me. So that may be your actual lived experience. That's a fact, that, so that's true. When I showed up at this place looking like this more than once, I didn't get any attention. But then as you move through and you push that down and you keep living, right? What the story becomes, whenever I show up somewhere, if I am not perfectly dressed or completely appropriate, or if I don't have the right words, or if I don't show up at the right time, I'm no one's ever going to pay attention to me. I'm never going to have a reputation. Nobody's ever going to give me an opportunity. Never, never, ever, ever, never, never. That's not true. Your experience around those partic particular situations is true, but the story that you will never be recognized, you will never be able to fit, you will never be able to be the center of attention, if that's your thing, because of who you are, how you look or where you showed up or how you dress or any of that kind of stuff, that's not necessarily a true story. So that's the head trash we got to deal with that impacts our presence and limits our use of that presence as power. Because we're telling ourselves already that we don't have it, that we can't do it, that we're not worthy. Because that's what a lot of this gets down to. Is it something we deserve? Is it something we, we're worthy of having? Are we worthy of being in this room with all these other people? Do we deserve to be in this same room? Do we deserve to have that opportunity? Do we deserve that promotion? Are we worthy of the accolades that we're getting? That's head trash. And so you owe yourself the gift of working through that mess. Or not, you get a choice, right? But if you do, if you're willing to do the hard work to work through that, then as you begin to show up more and more confidently and competently in your leadership and where you want to be and how you want to be, you will begin to see your presence turn into more power. So yeah, people are going to see you. They're going to know you. They're going to recognize you. But more importantly, they're going to listen to you. You're going to be able to truly use your presence as influence. You're going to be able to impact change. That's real power. The power to make a difference. The power to have an impact on outcomes. That's what real leaders do. And leadership is about behavior. It's not about position. And that behavior includes how you show up. How you tell people, hey, here's who I am. What you see is what you get. 
And and a caveat on that too. Sometimes we use what you see is what you get as, you know what, I just don't feel like changing. I'm not going to change. Like me, don't like me. It doesn't matter. This is who I am. In fact, there are people who will say those exact words. And if you mean that, okay. If you're good with that, okay. But if that's just because you're being cantankerous and stubborn and you know better, then you need to think about that. There are often times, I think Jerry and I talked about this a few weeks ago, when you're talking about being present and showing up for things that I really have to sit down with myself and say, okay, Laurel, are you not going because you really truly don't want to go? There's something in your spirit that says don't go. Are you going just because you don't feel like being social and you're being cantankerous and you need to just get up, get dressed and go. Because when you do that, when you get up, get dressed and go, there's something or someone that is all that always happens or that always shows up. That was necessary. That was intended. But if you're sitting there in the funk just because you're being cantankerous, right? And contrary, you miss an opportunity as opposed to doing the work to pause and say, okay, does this really not feel right in my gut? Or am I just saying, I don't want to go? And okay, if I really just don't want to go and I'm, I so don't want to go so much that I'm not going to be able to fix my attitude or my face, then yeah, I should probably stay home. But don't just write things off because that's habit. That's easy. That's easy. But leaders do the hard work on themselves before they try to assist others. Put your mask on first. Put your mask on first. Do the things you need to do to get yourself to mastery around that area of leadership and showing up and who you are and and knowing who you are and what kind of leader you want to be and where you want to influence being really clear around those things. Cause when you are clear, you can be clear with and for others, but you got to do work to get there. And that's what takes the effort. That's what takes the effort. Cause we don't always, we don't always have the energy that we need. We don't always have the energy that we need and, and that's okay. Right. Cause we do have to put our mask on first and figure out how to get the energy. But sometimes we need to, set expectations of ourselves and then hold ourselves accountable for meeting those expectations so that we can move towards the outcomes that we've said we wanted because things don't happen just because we wish them things happen because we take action because we move remember a goal without a plan is just a wish things happen because we really are trying to make them happen. We're trying to show up. We're trying to participate. We're trying to be. That's what real leaders do. That's what true leaders do. That's what servant leaders do. Servant leaders show up because they know it's not about them. It's about the person you're serving. And so using that presence, that consistent presence, that presence that can be trusted to develop the power to impact change, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. But that requires us being willing to say, Ooh, sorry, I didn't, I, I messed that up. I messed it up. I'll do better next time. I'll do better next time. And then do better. Cause that's the thing. It's, it's, um, you know, we, there's, there's this book called, um, the five love languages. I think probably everybody's seen. Um, and you can take that they you can actually take a quiz online to find out what your love language is. Um, and he's written, I think, a number of books, love languages for couples, for singles, for all kinds of books around love languages. But anyway, um, he's got that. But there's also one that a quiz around um, your apology language. And unsurprising, <laughs> my apology language is, yeah, your apology is great, but I need to see change behavior. Because if I don't see change behavior, your apology meant nothing to me. And as I've said, you know, your apology needs to be as public and as loud as your disrespect was. So I need change behavior. Otherwise, it's just words. And that's the same thing that people look for in leaders. They listen to what you say, but people will believe what you do. And so you can say all the nice, pretty words and you can own your own stuff and you can be vulnerable and you can be authentic and you can say, Hey, my mind is really messy. And I just, it's just hard today and I'm not showing up. And, and I just, you know, I just need a little grace and I need a little, but if your behavior is you don't give anybody else that, 
or someone else who comes to you feeling vulnerable and being open and honest, you beat them up. What they say is that's not who they really are. And I won't ever make that mistake again. I'll never bring up my stuff again. I'll never talk about my stuff again. Because your behavior has told them that that's who you really are. You're really the person that doesn't, not only doesn't want to be vulnerable, not really, but absolutely is not going to give space or grace to other people to show up that way. We teach people how to treat us. And that's whether treat us personally, or we teach people how to work with us as leaders. We teach them. If we always say, we want you to be innovative, we want you to move, we want you to, to fail fast, and then as soon as somebody fails, we fire them or we punish them or we don't promote them. Our words that all the beautiful things that walk the company line, our action said, that person is dangerous. That's a dangerous leader. When we say things like, oh my gosh, and make people believe, we promote the best and the brightest. But that's not who we promote. We promote the people who are the best connected. We promote the people who stay the latest because we got a culture that watches the clock. So you can be there till eight or nine o'clock, but you really didn't start working until about 5 p.m. So all the people who are really efficient and getting stuff done and getting it done early are seen as slackers. But those folks who don't get anything done during the day and save it all for that 5 to 8 p.m., because they know the boss are kind of walking around and seeing who's still there, getting over, right? Those are the kind of things that begin to erode trust. That's what we're teaching people. We're teaching people that here is about how long you stay, not about how good you are. And the thing we have to recognize as leaders is number one, try not to manage uniformly because everybody needs something a little bit different. You want to be consistent, but consistent doesn't mean exactly the same. Those are two different things. Treating people consistently means everybody gets, you know, a bonus. That's consistency. Treating people the same is like a cola. Everybody gets 2%. That's treating everybody the same. You can differentiate and be consistent because we are consistently evaluating everybody to be able to reward people in a way that, that makes sense based on their performance. So we are consistently showing up. We're consistently acting. We are consistently executing processes. Consistency builds trust because consistency builds reliability, right? And that reliability that leads to trust leads to power to make decisions that make an impact. It all ties together, guys. And, and because words matter, we got to think about what we mean when we say presence and power. <clears throat> and being present versus having a presence and exuding pow power, right? Versus being in a position of power because being in a position of power doesn't mean you're powerful. It just means you have power to impact others, good or bad, right? There's a difference. Being in a position of power means that you can do things unto others. Being powerful means you actually have people following you, right? Believing you, understanding you, supporting you. That's real power where you can impact discussions and impact and influence perspectives. The other kind of powerful impacts as well, negatively and positively, but that other kind of power doesn't have trust associated with it. The greatest power is not only of influence, but also of trust. And so when you think about how you're showing up and how you're going to be present and what you want your presence to be, how are you connecting that to how you're, how people can trust you, how they can align with you and how are you figuring out how you can be trusted? How are you figuring out how you can trust your plan, how you can trust the opportunities that show up for you? That's that messiness too. Right? Again, I need to know my gut. And you got to trust your gut. But you also sometimes got to question your gut. Because sometimes something that shows up as gut is just mine, just head trash. It's just that more surface level, I don't want it. Right? It's the, it's the fight or flight. 
that that dorsal or, or sympathetic nervous system, right, as opposed to ventral. Not the place that is in his own genius, not the place that is, is logical, but the place that is emotional, right, and nervous system response. So you got to figure out a way to really recognize your real gut, right, your real gut versus just that nervous system thinking. Because I know for me, I can think my way into or out of anything. I just can't, right? But when it's really critical, it is important to not just think, but to feel, to understand, to recognize, okay, here's what I think, but let me just pause. What does that feel like? Does that feel right? Does it not feel right? Am I missing something? Because if I'm thinking more about how it feels and how I relate to it completely physically and maybe even metaphysically, then my response might be a little bit more accurate, right? My response might be a little bit more tied to what's really happening and not just kind of this, this visceral nervous system response to something. That's what's important when you're talking about power and presence is really knowing yourself so that you can serve others. Excuse me, guys, this is kind of crazy. So as we move into or out of this week of having to take a ton of lemons and make lots of lemonade, because that's what we do. That's what leaders do. We just figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. It is important. I really want you guys to think, think through the rest of this week about how you're showing up and how you're, how you're being present and how your presence is playing out for people. And is your presence just kind of this influencer, everybody knows my name, or is your presence connected to a really great ability to influence and impact and make a difference, right? To be able to speak truth to power, to have the courage to do that, to have the courage to show up and have conversations that are difficult conversations, but from an authentic place to be able to listen actively. Because when you listen actively, right, that means really, really listening to understand, not listening to respond. You are going to hear some things and see some things that you may not agree with, that you may not understand, that may reveal your own gaps in knowledge or ignorance around some things. But real leaders are lifelong learners and constant learners and take those opportunities and those those situations where we are not the smartest person in the room and use that as opportunities to learn because that's what you want you want to learn you want to be able to start mastering those things that are really critical and that line up in your zone of genius because that mastery is what really draws people to you and what gives you power to influence and impact now, if your mastery is being an influencer, right? Well, have at it, right? But, but that mastery piece is really about listening actively to be okay with the fact that you don't know everything. I, I prefer going in places where I am not the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. That's, I, that is where I like to be. I don't like being in a place where I'm the smartest person in a room. Too much pressure, right? But when I'm not the smartest person in the room, which is most of the time, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I intentionally make sure I'm in a lot of places where I'm not the smartest person in the room. There is so much learning in that. And I get jazzed up by hearing other people say stuff. I mean, that's why Holly and I have such a great connection. There's stuff that she says, experiences that she's had. We have some, some shared lived experiences, but just the things, the highlights, the, the insights that she has, I'm like, oh. It's just, it, like she said, what was it? Perfection doesn't make you priceless. Being perfect doesn't make you priceless. Hmm. You are priceless because you are here. Hearing those kind of things, talking to people who have spent time thinking about how the brain works and how behavior impacts leaders. Talking and being in conversation and community with people who are really driven to understand and to learn and to grow and to help others do that. 
that's where I get really jazzed. Because then as I learn, then I can pass that on. Being in places where you can connect people, right? I've got two connections I'm going to make this week. And I'm so excited to make them. And, and I had someone, I literally had someone yesterday say, why are you introducing people? I'm like, because I think they should meet. I think there might be a great opportunity there. And the, and the question came back to me, well, yeah, but what does that do for you? Really? What it does for me is I'm connecting great people, right? You put out, you reap what you sow. I am intentionally going out and making connections that I think are valuable because of the value of the connection not because I expect something out of it. The two people I'm connecting, I really like what I hear. I think they have great insight. I think they have great positions and I think the connection would be really masterful. If something comes out of that for me later on, great, but that's not the reason I did it. The power in the connection is the connection itself. And the, the beauty and the energy that I get from having made the connection, that's what I get out of it. I made the connection. And now there's a couple of people who didn't know each other before who are now connected. And who knows how that will ripple? It's the ripple effect, right? Who knows how that will ripple or what will come out of that for those two people? That in and of itself is such an amazing reward. And that for me feels like power. It's the power of connection. It's the power of impacting two people by introducing them to each other and seeing how that transpires, seeing how that grows, seeing how that connection manifests in this beautiful, amazing thing for those two people. Because I know it will in one way or the other. But if every time I went out and it was all about me and people coming back and saying, well, you know, we only met because of Laurel, if that was my big focus, or Laurel, hey, you know, we just got to make this connection. If it was all about that, or make sure when you post that, you only, you make sure you tell everybody you got it from me. Really? Although I do have to say, I did see someone repost something that I said, a quote that I said, it was actually a Laurel quote. It wasn't something I got from somebody else. It was actually a Laurel quote. And I saw somebody repost and I was like, I kind of felt some type of way. Like, wait a minute, you didn't say that came from me. And then I had to pause. I'm like, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. No, no. That's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> wait, but let me ask this a quick question. So when they reposted it, though, did they share it and your name is under it? No, it it? they completely created a whole new thing. Oh, that's It true. was completely like, and this person didn't know me and I didn't know them. It just happened to show up in my feed. Oh, that's still. And I was like, wow. I, wow. Mm. And and it did. I kind of felt some type of way. Sure. I really did. Now, I also hadn't copyrighted that quote. So I am copyrighting a bunch of stuff. Which, another celebration. The official trademark is done for the Rutledge Perspective. Whoop, 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 whoop. It is officially trademarked. Thank you. And thank you to my attorney, Stephen McVeigh. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so it's it's you know that that for me the power is in having a network wide enough and broad enough of people who are cool enough to to actually welcome those kind of connections because not everybody's cool with that. Not everybody's cool with you introducing them to somebody else, right? And also having a network of people that are also of the same mind who want to be connected for the sake of the connection and can they be of service to each other? Not, hey, I want to connect with you and then I get this whole long spiel when I connect of how, you know, buy my thing. By the way, that's really sleazy, y'all. To connect as if you just really want to connect and build your network and then all of a sudden I get this whole email about how I need to buy your thing. Don't, I hate that. Just don't do that. Don't do that. If you really want me to buy your thing, just tell me up front, hey, I'd like to connect with you because I see this about your business and I really think I can do stuff for you. And then let me make the decision. I may still connect with you because you've been honest. In fact, I did that the other day. I went to somebody and I said, you know what? I am absolutely not interested in this thing that you've got, but because you were upfront about why you were connecting and how you wanted to build your business, I'm all about that. So we will absolutely connect. And if I hear of somebody who actually needs it, I will send, it, send them in your direction. Because see, you were honest with me. You were forthright, you were forthcoming. You didn't try to sneak it in behind the scenes. That's what I mean. 
Now, some people don't have an issue with that. That just happens to be me. If you want to work with me, you got to be real and upfront. But when you are real and upfront, then that opens up not only me, but that opens up my network to you, such as it is, right? And there are some people on my list and I'm like, oh, if I ever hear that, that's the person I'm going to do because see, they were honest. They were authentic. They were upfront in the very beginning. Them I'm willing to give a referral to and say, you know, I haven't worked with them, but this is what they did. And this is why I'm referring them to you. Give them a shout out, you know, maybe look at their stuff. That is presence. That is power. That is being confident enough in your thing that you're willing to be upfront. Cause in my mind, if you got to connect with me under false pretenses, that means you're not confident enough in your stuff in what you're selling. That means you haven't really taken the time to look at my profile or figure out what I'm doing. I get so much stuff about, Hey, let me know if you need more it people. Hey, let me know if you need, have you looked at my profile? Have you looked at what's going on? It's the same thing with leaders and your people. When you ask stupid questions, have you, do you even know who they are? Do you know what they're doing every day? Do you know why they're showing up? Do you even understand who you're working with? And if you don't, why aren't you taking the time to change that? That is power, the power in the connection, the power in the vulnerability, because it takes some humility. It takes some compassion. It takes some curiosity to know more. Now, don't get me wrong. I am very much an introvert. I am, I am not the person that's going to remember the birthdays and ask about the kids. And I, that's not me. That is not me. That is not me. Now, that doesn't mean I don't care. That just means the way I'm wired is I'm not in your business like that. I'm just not, cause I don't want you in mind. Mm. There's stuff I share, right? But then there's stuff that I just don't think is relevant. <laughs> but what I've learned is that stuff is important to other people. So what do I do? It's not my thing, but I know there's always someone on my team that it really is their thing. So I'm like, okay, look, I need you to put birthdays on my calendar and I need you to, you know, I need you to help me because that's, it's not my thing. I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go to every baby shower. I'm not going to, I'm just, I'm just not, I'm just not. It, it literally, I, it just think about it, it. gives me highs. I can't, but I also know it's important to other people. And if I'm a real leader, then I understand through that empathy and compassion, what is important to others. And I do my best within my energy level to at least acknowledge and confirm and honor those things that are important to other people. And if telling you happy birthday on your birthday is important to you, then I got to figure out how to do that. Even if it's just a quick text, if it's a card, if it's a whatever, right? If saying congratulations on whatever is important to you, then I need to figure out how to do that as a leader because it's not about me. Leadership is not about me. Leadership is about the people you're leading. But I can also find a way to do that, that honors my energy, right? And how I'm wired and how my brain processes so that I can do it authentically. So when I say congratulations, I'm not like, congratulations, right? My smile didn't meet your eyes. Yay. That's great. So excited for you. Yay. Come on now. No, I want to be able to say that is so awesome. I'm so excited for you right? So I find a way to do that so it can be authentic. And I mean it. I mean it genuinely. But that takes a recognition that presence is not power, but that you need trust to build power and influence. And that power and influence that is built through trust is by your actions aligning with your words, by your willingness to be vulnerable and imperfect, and to tell people that. But not necessarily telling people how the sausage is made, but letting them know, you know, we're making sausage and the process is kind of messy, but we're going to figure it out by being willing to say, I don't know, and then go figure it out by being willing to say, you know what? It is not a good day. It's just not a good day. I'm doing the best I can today, but it's not a good day today. Tomorrow will be better. So here's, what we're gonna, here's how we're going to manage through today. Or I'm going to need a minute. I'm just going to need a minute. Um, I'm, I am. Um, I'm going to need to process that and be okay with that. 
right? And create space so that people who work for you and with you, when they tell you the same thing, you honor them too. You know what? I get that. You need to take all the time you need. We got to make a decision, but I understand you need to process. So go process and then let's come back and have a conversation. What does it hurt? And how much greater is the help and the impact? So. Can I add something? Say yes, something ma'am. Now? When you talked about, and I was talking about that earlier today, when you talked about we teach people how to treat us. Mm-hmm. And it is true. And even with social media, we can teach people how to treat us. Mm -hmm. When I had to go on my uh, business trip this week, I like to post a lot of things that I like to do, golfing and whatever, Mm -hmm. or being by water. And the host made sure that I was at golf places. I was by the water. So that's people who are concerned about how they're going to treat you. Mm -hmm. So those things are necessary because people who are really concerned about really knowing you will take the time to see how yeah. you flow so they don't know how to treat you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's about it's about being honest about that. You know, it's um, you know, I know I know me. And so when I go, I was just asked to to come back to do a, a speech next year and I'm so excited because it's gonna be in person next year and it's gonna be bigger and I'm just <laughs> I'm so excited about that. Um, and the women are just amazing. Um, so I'm really, really psyched about it. It's gonna be on May 6th, so I'll start start advertising about that soon too. Um you know, it's, they just, they were so nice and they treated me so well. And it was, I just knew I was well taken care of. You know, they knew when I was coming in, I had, they picked me up from the airport. They made sure I was staying at a place that had restaurants around it. And I mean, it just, and I'm pretty simple and I'm also pretty introverted. So, you know, you don't have to schedule big old dinners and stuff for me. Cause I'm, I'm, it's going to take, if I'm showing up for something, that is all of my energy is going into that. So I'm going to need a minute. So there was a very small kind of gathering afterwards and there was no pressure to stay for dinner and there was no, mm-hmm. because they knew me and they knew it wasn't that I was being antisocial or I was trying not to show up. They knew, okay, she's at the, she's at the end of her energy level. <laughs> so we, we got all we could get, mm-hmm. right? But she's, she's fine and she's going to continue to show up. And if we ask her, she will stay, but we know better. And there's nothing like having a host that knows you and that honors you so that you can show up for them. Cause that's the point yes. you're showing up for them. And by them honoring what you need, you are able to deliver what they need. It's a relationship y'all. It's a relationship. It's not one way. Relationships are two way. So you're exactly right, Jerry. We teach people how to treat us. Right. And then we also learn how to treat others by how we want to be treated. It's the golden rule. Treat others how you want to be treated. And another point you made that is very important that you talked about even in, and that was, I mean, it's ironic you're talking about this because I was just talking about this today about being equally yoked. Yeah. And you said with Holly, she makes your baby leap. She gets yeah. you excited because you guys are sitting there yeah. and you fall off, you know, you, you know, you know, bat off at yes. each other. And it's not wrong to have your yeah. pick of what makes you feel yeah. excited. Yes. And for so many times, I think people struggle that just yeah. because people like you or want to be your friend doesn't mean <laughs> right. you have to reciprocate. You can be kind. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There is a difference in acquaintances mm-hmm. and friends and villages. I have a ton of acquaintances, a ton of acquaintances, and I respect all of them and I honor all of them and, and we will chat and we will get together and we'll, you know, they are acquaintances Then I have friends. Right. And, and we do a little bit more, right. They can call on me a little bit more. And then I have folks that are in my village. Mm-hmm. Now the folks that are in my village, those are the folks you may turn things upside down for, right. Mm-hmm. Those are the folks you show up for. Those are the folks that whatever's happening, if your phone rings from one of them, it's ride or die. What can I do? Is everything okay? That's the village. And everybody's world has all of those things in it. But just because you are not best friends doesn't mean you have to be ugly. Right. You don't have to be ugly. You can honor your time and your energy without being nasty. Mm-hmm. Those things are not mutually exclusive. They are just not. Because you never know when that opportunity may come back around again. And you could be best friends. You never Absolutely. know. But until then, and then you said the last thing you said about showing up versus presence. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're talking mm-hmm. about? And I was thinking about, you know, there's some people want to be seen and there's some who are shown. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. And when you're shown, it's already evident that you have the presence along with the influence and the ability to make some changes. So our goal should be coming from being seen to being shown to, so we can show up with power. Because you write yes. so many influencers of how you think, but is there power behind that? And a lot of people, especially with social media, yeah. you just want a bunch of followers, but where are we taking them and what is it going to do for anybody? What is it benefiting yeah. them, right? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I love that, Jerry, being shown as opposed to being seen. People calling on you as opposed yeah. to you having to call on them. <laughs> and that doesn't mean you don't work, right? That doesn't mean you just sit back and just wait for stuff to come to you. Because in order for you to be shown, you have to have done some work. People have to have seen you work, seen you work in order for them to decide to show you because see they're using their reputation to show you. So you need to show up and show out for the people who were showing it again. They're using their reputation. They are using their reputation to show you. Mm -hmm. So you owe it to them to show up That's right. and show out because they have a choice. So never forget when somebody promotes you when somebody sponsors you remember a sponsor versus a mentor a sponsor is somebody who brings your name up in a room when you're not even there mm -hmm. it is your responsibility when someone uses their influence and their power to promote you to show up and to give them the respect of bringing everything you got that gave them the trust in you to bring your name up and if something's going wrong to be honest about it you don't just not show up you don't show up and half do. You don't do that. If something goes wrong, you let people know early. That's pow There's power in that, right? Because that's about trust. Because yes. things happen, y'all. We had to make so much lemonade this last seven days yes. out of all these lemons, but we made it. We made it, right? So people trust that we're going to figure out how to show up. We couldn't do this yesterday. I'm here today. We've got a couple more shows we're going to be making up. I'll be announcing those. They're coming up in November. We'll be there a couple of weeks. We'll do two shows a week. So you just show up and you give everything you have. That's what we do. And I want to say this too, because when I did call you mm -hmm. from the airport and I missed my flight, I couldn't catch my flight. The yep. flight got canceled. And you were, before there was times that I was like, oh God, they're not going to understand. Yeah. They're going to be all, you were like, no, sweetie, take your time. It's okay. And I said, can we do it today? And you move some things around. Yeah. And that's powerful because you have to know who you're dealing with and who you're working with. Because there was really no fear or panic of me because I didn't think that you would act right. up, you know, act ugly. You know? Right. <laughs> and I can act up when I need to. I can, that, that other Laurel can show up when the time is necessary. But, but yeah, you know, that's, that's the thing, guys. There is also power in that calm, yeah. right? In picking your battles knowing when it's time to fight and when it's time to just say, you know what, this is happening. How, how, would it be, how would it have been for Jerry to call me and say, I just can't get Megan for me to nut up? What's that about? Did, is she flying the plane? She's not flying the plane. Right. Then I'm coming back. <laughs> you got to deal with that. Right? And, <laughs> right? and then I will have nutted up and I see her and she's like, see, yeah, see. We, we, we love the relish perspective as long as it's on. This will be the last show. Right? <laughs> no, I'm just ready so I'm just saying, you know, so it is important as we do these things, y'all, to understand the power of your presence. Yes. That there is power in presence. And that just having people know your name is not power. That is just presence. And you need both to make an impact. So, all right. That's the show this week, y'all. Looks like I took the banner off some kind of way, too. So, you know, it's, again, technology. Mercury's in retrograde. I'm not buying a computer yet until after October Now, 18th. what does that mean? Those that means everything's all jacked up. So okay. from a technology perspective. So basically what I have learned, I had heard people say this for years. So, and it's all about this um, alignment, right? The planetary alignment. So if you're into astrology, the planetary alignment and how things move around and where the planets move and where the stars move. And so when Mercury is in retrograde, that's like stirring up the universe, not in a great way. And it's really bad for technology. Wait a minute, Laura. So because September 27th through October 18th, Mercury's in retrograde. So stuff is kind of haywire in the in the in the world. So like so like the technology issue we had, Mercury was in retrograde. Because I've been having this feeling yes, when I got I said something seems off. I, I didn't know believe it until I got into my own business and I'm really having to be my own tech support. I'm like, now I know what people meant when they say Mercury's in retrograde and what it does to technology. Yes. 
all the tech issues that have been happening. I, I need I need a new laptop so bad. I refuse to buy it until Mercury's out of retrograde. I refuse. And I'm getting ready to go back and look and see when we bought my mom's laptop because her laptop is the exact same as mine, the exact same year, and she has had more issues with it. And I'm thinking I must have bought it when Mercury's in retrograde. So when do we know this Mercury's out of retrograde? How it's on know? October 18th. I Googled it. You so <laughs> I Googled it. Because I, I need to know. <laughs> I need to know because see, I need to know when I can get back to getting stuff done because it's been it's been a nightmare. It's been a tech nightmare lately. You know me use that excuse. I know like talk right now. Right, Mercury's in retrograde. So, if Mer y'all, no tech right now. Just wait. Just wait. All right. It's been real. Next week we're back on the regular day, Tuesday, 10 a.m. Central. We'll see you then. Bye, everybody.